Thank you, CSA. I'm excited to be here. I've been to a number of CSA events over the years, and so it's really an honor to be able to speak at one today. Uh, my name is Greg Zemlin. I'm on the product marketing team here at Wiz. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Wiz, we've really reinvented cloud security uh, from the ground up. So we're a cloud security solution that was really born in the cloud and built for the cloud. Uh, so to, today we're going to talk a little bit about navigating the complexity of the cloud and cloud native attacks, and then talk about this, really this idea of a dual approach to proactive and reactive security. So as we get started here, a uh, quick agenda. So we're going to take a look at why the cloud changes security and kind of what's behind that shift and why we need a shift in mindset for cloud security in general. Next, we're going to jump into some common themes from cloud threats, and we'll do a deeper dive into a, a couple uh, named cloud threats from the last year or so. Uh, then we'll touch on these proactive and reactive security approaches. And really, it'll be a common theme throughout the presentation, but we'll do a deeper dive into to what I mean by that. And then finally, looking at the reactive approaches, which is really you can think of as cloud detection and response, um, why it needs to be reimagined for the cloud, along with uh, a lot of other uh, topic areas. So I always like to start with this slide, and it's important for everybody to remember that the cloud really changes everything. Um, it starts with the environment being new. Um, so, you know, we went from where we were to really developers owning the infrastructure. They own the technology choices, they own uh, the architecture that they're gonna use. The speed of in innovation is just drastically increased and it's great from a business perspective, it's great from an application development perspective, but it creates a, a difficult situation for security teams in general. And along with this new environment, it's now not just single cloud, it's multi-cloud, multi-architecture, we have so many different abstraction layers, uh, different services, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, containerized applications, serverless applications, just hundreds of thousands of thing, things for security teams to keep track of. Additionally, there's new risk. So exposure remains a huge, huge risk in the cloud, but just the speed and velocity that exposure can be exploited is something that we haven't seen before. Uh, so really, you know, a matter of minutes to hours, if something's left exposed, somebody can oftentimes find it. And finally, a new ownership model. So I alluded to this a little bit, but, you know, developers are now owning the infrastructure. And so the security teams that were used to this centralized architecture, it becomes obsolete almost. So again, multi-clouds, different technologies, different architectures, we really need to ingrain a culture of knowledge and security into every team that's associated with security now. And this has moved well beyond the SOC and IR teams. We now have cloud security, we now have DevOps, we now have developers. So we really need to really democratize security across the organization to have an effective security program. So along with all this complexity, really just growth and explosion in cloud. So this is a quick look at AWS API account. It's consistent with Azure, it's consistent with GCP, uh, OCI. So really just explosion of complexity and explosion of growth here. And so I, I mentioned exposure remaining a key risk. And to me, it's interesting that this is still one of the main drivers for security incidents because it seems like something that's well within our control. But again, we look at the complexity of this environment, these environments, and it's just it's oftentimes really easy to overlook. So exposure comes in different forms, publicly exposed buckets, exposed API with web access to data identity exposed resources. And we see this time and time again. So Toyota just had a massive data breach because of exposure. Microsoft AI did and Thomson Reuters did. Um, but in reality, over 55% of companies have at least one publicly exposed database. And, you know, that's, that's kind of scary to think about. And, um, to go beyond that, you know, Gartner predicts that by 2025 next year, 99% of cloud security failures will come from some kind of human error or misconfiguration. 
So we, we really need to get better there. And so, you know, we think of exposure, I mentioned like the time to exploit some of these exposures. I've seen these numbers before, every time I read them, it kind of astonishes me, but an exposed S3 bucket referenced in a GitHub repo, it takes seven hours for somebody to find this bucket and expose this bucket. We look at some common technologies that are used. How long does it take a newly created cluster to get a malicious scan? So EKS cluster is 22 minutes after creation. AKS is a little bit better with two hours and 13 minutes and GKE is moderately better at two hours and 43 minutes. But so for all the major cloud service providers upon creation of a cluster, you're, you're getting a malicious scan within three hours. And it's just insane to think about. So with this, um, this isn't necessarily uh, unique to cloud uh, threats, but it's something that we're seeing more and more often here as a whole. So really every, every uh, cloud threat starts with a initial access, and then there's some kind of to toxic combination that allows for lateral movement within the environment. So some common initial access uh, types that we've seen recently are remote code execution with a vulnerability or, or misconfigured application, end user compromise. Uh, we saw this with Circle CI, uh, supply chain, the big one here, solar winds, obviously. And then external exposure are really something that enables lateral movement. So insecure secrets have been a uh, common theme as of lately. Excessive privileges will actually take a little bit deeper dive here with an attack called broken sesame, weak authentication. And so it's really coupling this initial, initial access with lateral movement that, you know, one, it makes it complex for, for teams to eliminate in the first place, and it makes it extremely difficult to understand kind of the blast radius when one of these attacks do happen. So I want to start with Broken Sesame because uh, this is actually an attack that was mitigated before it was an actual attack. So we have, you know, a really world-class threat research team at Wiz, and part of what they do is, is uh, ethical hacking, and they go and they expose vulnerabilities and they help organizations mitigate these vulnerabilities before something bad does happen. So Broken Sesame was one of these attacks. Um, this was uh, one of our research projects was in Alibaba Cloud. And so our team found a string of vulnerabilities in two of Alibaba Cloud's popular services, uh, Aspara DB and Analytic DB for Postgres. So upon uh, finding these vulnerabilities, they were actually able to perform remote code execution. And so once they did that, they realized they were in a container within a Kubernetes environment. And actually their, their common movement path is to reach out to the Kubernetes API server and pull back information about the cluster and see if they can escalate their privileges from there. Um, good on Alibaba Cloud, that particular container didn't actually have access to the API server. So they had to take a little bit different means here. And so, they were actually able to uh, achieve privilege escalation through a vulnerability in a cron job task. And then from there, all because of a shared PID namespace, they were actually able to perform lateral movement to a neighboring container with escalated privileges. And so in a side here, um, while they were in that container with uh, escalated privileges, they found pools belonging to other tenants actually, which uh, indicated multi-tenancy and actually mean they could have uh, moved across pods if they so choose to. So finally, now the piece here is really about excessive permission. So Alibaba Cloud used a private container image repo. We were able to obtain the credentials to access it. And upon testing the credentials, we actually found that we not only had re read permissions, but we had write permissions. So at this point, you know, it's a bad, bad situation for Alibaba Cloud. Um, so had we been nefarious, we could have overwritten any container images that we wanted, or we could have carried out a pretty wide scale uh, supply chain attack on the service. So this is just a good example of, you know, those toxic combinations of oh, initial access and lateral movement. So I'll follow this up by saying, uh, 
you know, this is done in an ethical way. We immediately reported this to Alibaba Cloud. Um, our teams actually helped their security teams work through and fix this before anybody exposed this issue. And, you know, during the process that we were working with their team, um, they mentioned that after the fact, they actually saw uh, our team performing this. And so it begs the question about like reactive security, that detection and response side, Something that is so, so important um, is being able to keep pace with attackers. So you need that immediate detection, you need the context from the detection, and you need to take you know, very fast, swift, immediate action to actually stop an attacker in their tracks before they cause serious business impact. But in general, how do organizations prevent this? So for initial access, um, you know, oftentimes it's all about proactive security and reducing risk in your environment. And so for this particular one, um, scanning for external exposure is a huge one. And unfortunately, a lot of organizations just handle that from the inside out. Um, but having a tool that allows you to look from the outside in, really give you that view of an attacker can be critical for organizations. And so that piece really helps with the detection and remediation of critical vulnerabilities. So we are far, far beyond the days of where we can scan our environment, uh, come up with a list of critical vulnerabilities and go to our development teams and say, hey, fix all these vulnerabilities for us. They really need uh, an idea of how to prioritize for what uh, vulnerabilities actually uh, pose the most risk in the environment. And so using the context from environment, using the context from external exposure, empowering development teams to actually uh, understand the impact of their vulnerabilities helps create that security culture and ultimately improve the organization's security. So for attack service reduction in the control plane, a frequent cluster updating strategy um, for this and all attacks that uh, have a lateral movement component, Runtime protection is extremely important. So understanding um, actually what's going on at the resource level and being able to detect and respond swiftly is uh, really, really important here. And then finally, the prevention aspect of lateral movement, just smart namespace-based isolation with RBAC, improve network policies, improve user namespaces, and then every organization should do this everywhere, but just continuous review of IAM and RBAC hygiene. So this attack, uh, you know, it, it brings up some interesting challenges and unique attack vectors for organizations. So we look at the attack path here, initial access, lateral movement, crown jewels, right? And that's a common theme, whether it's broken sesame or team TNT attack, which we'll look at in a couple minutes. And then it brings up your security goals. So really, you know, the proactive piece of security is all about identifying risk in your production environment, removing that risk and ultimately reducing your attack paths. And so in a perfect world, we'd be able to create riskless production environments. We'd never have to actually worry about initial access and lateral movement, but you know we're not there today, unfortunately. So we have to be prepared with that reactive side of security. So after initial access, how quick can I detect and investigate and respond to initial access and lateral movement? How can I detect and limit the blast radius and ultimately limit the business impact of uh, an attack itself? So that leads organizations to need a defense in depth strategy that starts with prevention and ends with active detection and response. So before we even get to the prevention, I think it's important to understand depending on where you are with your cloud security journey, um, you need to take a look at your production environment first, and you need to understand what risk is already in your production environment, and you need to reduce the critical risk in production first. And then you get to the preventative piece, which is uh, commonly called secure cloud development or shift left. And it's all about bringing your security knowledge into your development pipeline and really mitigating risk before it ever has a chance to get to your production environment. We see on average, it's a hundred times cheaper for organizations to actually uh, mitigate risk during development than when it actually makes it to production. 
And then finally, uh, your det detection and response capabilities. So in the event that you don't reduce all risk, which we know is unfeasible now, you need to be able to detect and respond quickly. So detection and response is another area that really needs to be reimagined for the cloud. So we look at this simple story, just think about machine identity being compromised, enumeration of privileges, and then ultimately your cloud is compromised. So if we look at kind of legacy approaches to detection, you're either looking at runtime or you're looking at cloud events. And the, the thing here is that, you know, if you're looking at runtime, you may see some suspicious process execution. Then another team may be looking at cloud logs and see the IAM enumeration alert. And so unless you get really lucky and these teams are collaborating together, you're gonna miss this. Um, or if you have everything sent to a SIM and you're lucky enough to write a custom correlation rule, maybe you'll catch this one. But it's it's something that organizations should not really leave in the hands of, uh, of chance, so to speak. So you need to reimagine detections. You need to couple uh, runtime events with cloud events, understand what's going on kind of at the, the resource level along with uh, the control plane level. Second is investigation. So really a detection in the cloud without context is it's not actionable at all. It's almost, it's almost meaningless for teams. So you need to understand the context from your infrastructure, the context from permissions, from IAM, from secrets, just everything coupled together to actually make a detection actionable leads you to be able to respond to that. And you need to be able to respond swiftly and at scale. And this can be done in a number of ways through image or process lockdown or VM isolation. So looking at a quick advanced uh, example of what I mean by this reimagined CDR, uh, I mentioned the team, team TNT attack before. And those of you that are not familiar with it, at a high level, Team TNT is a, a a threat group that really focuses oftentimes on crypto mining. Um, and in this particular case, uh, what they did, they were able to access a cont container uh, through a vulnerability. And, you know, they installed a crypto miner on that container purely as a diversion to their lateral movement and ultimately uh, data exfiltration of PII from an organization that I won't name. But really with a reimagined CDR, you'd be able to stop this in its tracks. So kind of step one is the real-time detection of known and unknown threats. So in this example, we'd catch process to establish connection to an unknown or to a known crypto mining domain. So that's one piece. But again, if you don't have the context with that piece, it's not going to immediately alert teams that they need to take action like now. So step two of that would be actually correlating real-time cloud event and workload events for end-to-end -end kill chain visibility, right? So we look at the, can, the actual container uh, was accessed. We see a reverse shell detected and we see the crypto miner uh, installed purely for the diversion on that container. But then on top of that, we see lateral movement to detect a service account token usage and privilege escalation detected. So with all of those pieces and context from runtime and cloud events, uh, teams are actually able to take quick, uh, swift and immediate action. So finally, in step three, you understand that context. You understand uh, the whole blast radius of the attack. It now gives you what you need to stop this attack before it becomes an issue. So we see the reverse shell detected, we can isolate the container. We see the crypto miner installed, we can kill the process that's running the crypto miner. We can remove sensitive data access when the lateral movements perform. So just a whole number of, of ways to actually respond to this threat in real time as it's unfolding and minimize the business impact on your organization. So I know we've gone over a lot today. Uh, so now we'll take a quick look at just a summary of proactive and reactive security. So proactive security really in my mind consists of two pieces. It's cloud security posture management and secure cloud development. And so cloud security posture management is all about 
mitigating uh, risk in your production environment. It's done with agentless visibility. You get a full prioritized risk queue to really give teams uh, the context and understanding of why this risk is important. And again, you know, get that organizational buy-in and security mindset to proactively address those risk vectors. Next, you shift over into secure cloud development, and this is all about bringing your security knowledge into your development lifecycle and mitigating that risk before it ever makes it to your production environment. And finally, um, you know, we create that security backstop, and this is what's called reactive security in my mind, and that is cloud threat detection and response. So again, we can't reduce all risk from our production environment, and we need to be prepared to really accurately detect across layers, um, have all the context that we need for uh, rapid investigation and triage, and ultimately be able to respond uh, swiftly and at scale to these attacks. So quick summary from today, uh, cloud threats provide a unique challenge for security teams. Organizations need to leverage both these proactive and reactive approaches to security. The cloud decentralizes ownership. Uh, a new operating model is required for collaboration between teams. Really this, uh, this shift in organizational mindset for security first across teams. And then finally, detection and response really needs to be reimagined uh, to be effective in the cloud. Here's my contact information. If uh, anybody is interested to find out more about how Wiz solves these problems, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.